Hi, my name is uh, Jeff Rule, and I am a PhD candidate and contract instructor at the School of Canadian Studies. And Peter Hodgins asked me to um, just give a brief discussion around the speaker series that uh, we're all here for. Uh, I was one of the co organizers of the inaugural Vickers Verdun Annual Speaker Series of Canadian Studies. It was created in 2011 to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Carlton Trent Joint PhD. At the time, Andre Loisel, then director of the school, tasked some of the PhD students with creating and coordinating a suitable event uh, to mark the occasion here at Carlton. That decennial event committee consisted of Robin Green, Christine Kelly, and myself. And it was a pleasure to work with Christine and Robin on this. We resolved to establish a speaker series that honored two of the founding voices who initiated the dialogue across programs, across institutions, and of course, across Highway 7. And for anybody who's been in the program, we, it's, it's you know, it's kind of an endearing um, community building event, having to uh, go from Peterborough to uh, Ottawa to Peterborough, and from Peterborough back to Ottawa. It's, Long stretch of highway, but beautiful Indian shield. The establishment of <clears throat> the first interdisciplinary PhD in Canadian studies was the outcome of tremendous effort and collaboration between Carlton and Trent. And there were many who worked tirelessly in its realization and who we are as PhD students in that program, uh, and who we as PhD students in that program remain indebted. To paraphrase John Wadlund's Voices in Search of a Conversation, they created, for those voices in search, the space for conversation. This speaker series recognizes the bridge work undertaken by Professor Jill Vickers and Professor, uh, Professor Crystal Verdun. The spirit of dialogue, cooperation, and mutual interest not only in Canadian scholarship, but their commitment to Canadian studies as a legitimate, relevant, and necessary field of academic inquiry. It is this legacy we chose to honor in 2011 and it is this legacy we honor tonight. And we are most honored to have Professor Vic, uh, Verdun here with us in attendance. And I would ask all of you to join me in welcoming her. Uh, this is now our fifth, and, uh, fifth offering of the Vickers Verdun. And it is with immense pride that we mark the continuation of this series to see it reach this milestone, to know that what we had originally intended and hoped would become an annual event has in fact lived up to its name. We designed it to offer critical perspectives and multiple voices challenging how we study Canada and indeed how we practice Canadian studies. Over the years we have had tremendous speakers, professors uh, Vickers and Verdun uh, spoke at the inaugural. This was followed by Professor Ian Mackay in 2012 Professor Ronaldo Walcott in 2013, and Professor Benita Lawrence in 2014. And it is most gratifying to note that in this year's offering, uh, we are returning to the original vision with which the series was imagined, collaborative dialogue across multiple voices. I would also like to mention that we are pleased to announce that some of our past offerings of the Vickers Redone series are now available on the school's YouTube channel, uh, so you can access uh, some of our archived uh, video footage from those lectures. In marking the ongoing continuation of this series, there are a number of people we'd like to thank uh, and acknowledge for making this year's Vickers for Done possible. First and foremost are this year's organizers, Peter Hodgins, Trina cooper Bolam, and Kathy Schmeck, uh, who is our program administrator and uh, has provided indispensable support over the last five years. Kathy is retiring this year and will, in fact, in a month or two. I know, and it's, it's she's going to leave a tremendous void not only in how the series comes to be, but just in the school in general. And we're going to miss her very, very much. Um, I would also like to thank the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, John Osborne, for his ongoing support of the series. Of course, I would like to thank our speakers tonight, Jeff Thomas. Trina Cooper Bolum and David Lemelin for their talk, for their talk tonight, and to you, the audience, for joining us at this, our fifth annual Vickers Redone. 
So now I uh, turn the podium over to Peter Hodgins, uh, director of the School of Canadian Studies, who will introduce tonight's speakers. I'd like to thank Jeff for the lovely introduction to my introduction. Um, and thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Peter Hodgins, as you've probably figured out by now. I'm the director of the School of Canadian Studies, and it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speakers. Um, the most prominent member of our group of speakers, Jeff Thomas. He's best known as a photographer whose work interrogates the lines between white appropriations of indigeneity, indigenous subversions of those appropriations, and the poetics, performance, and possibilities of indigeneity in urban settings. For those of us who teach in the areas of indigenous studies, contemporary Canadian cultural studies, critical race studies, and art history, his work and the growing critical literature on it has become a staple in our classrooms point where I actually had a, heard a student say, oh, another thing on Jeff Thomas? <laughs> which which is, means you are now part of the canon. <laughs> um, his photo essays on Ottawa, and specifically his monuments, have forced me and likely many others in this room to look at our previously taken for granted urban and monumental environments with new and far more critical eyes. Along with being one of Canada's most important photographers, Jeff has also been nationally record recognized for his groundbreaking scholarship and his innovative curatorial practice. He's been involved in major pro projects at such prominent cultural institutions as, as the Canadian Museum of Civilization, the Woodlands Cultural Centre, the Art Gallery of Ontario, and Library of Art Science Canada. David Levelin is the founder of Stonefield Studio, a design firm devoted to crafting stories from blank spaces. His work has supported the messaging of diverse range of companies from, such as Chio, Mitel, Air Canada, World Vision, the Agapan Foundation, and most intriguingly, the Canadian Space Agency. <laughs> it can be seen at the Canadian Aviation Museum, the Museum of Nature, and numerous national capital area hospitals and offices. Trina Cooper Guillaume, who is my partner in crime, am organizing this, and, and Speaking to her bad judgment, my former student as well, <laughs> is pursuing a doctorate in cultural mediations. Her research draws on critical historiography and decolonization theory to analyze museological representations of the Indian residential school system in Canada. Her MA thesis in Canadian studies examined Canada's federal heritage infrastructure in relation to, to, to its engagements with the built heritage of Indian residential school. Before returning to school, Trina spent a decade working at and directing at least one of them at the Aboriginal Healing and Legacy of Hope Foundations. She's also an ex exhibition designer and the creative director of Nation Media and Design. With the assistance of David and Trina, Jeff has recently been working on a redesign of Shingwa Hall, a former residential school in Sault Ste. Marie, in order to transform it from a site of trauma to a site and state violence to a site of conscience. To borrow from Dean Oliver Florence, welcome and address to the People's Summit on Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women held here at Carleton last month. One of the most important duties of universities in democratic societies is to be a place where uncomfortable discussions about such histories of violence and their haunting after effects can take place. Tonight's talk promises to live up to that solid duty. At the same time, Hal Oliver, it promised to teach us all valuable lessons about communal resilience, solidarity, hope, healing, and ingenuity. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Thomas, David Lennon, and Trina Cooper. Thank you. Uh, 
And a colleague of mine, who is a director of research at the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, John Dewar, who is coincidentally a PhD student in Canadian Studies here at Colton, um, he became the director of the Shane Walk Project um, at Algoma University. Um, and he invited us to become involved with a project to develop something that he referred to as the Museum and Interpretation Center of world-class museum exhibitions. We really didn't know what yet, but he invited us to participate in this project. And so while it isn't a redesign of Xinhua Hall per se, it is um, in part uh, a heritage restoration, in part a rehabilitation, and in part, I would suggest, an interpretation center. And so, um, having been contacted by John to, 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 to do that work, um, we put together our dynamic team of people. <laughs> and um, I think that Jeff is going to talk a little bit about uh, the working relationship with the LHF, and I don't want to uh, encroach on that in any way. Um, but about this project and about this building, um, so we were asked to develop these museum exhibitions, and they're to really to honor the story of survivors and to affect the transformation of a colonized space into one of healing and reconciliation. So in a sense, to decolonize the space. Um, and here's an image of the space. Um, and, and this is really the Shinwok home in its third iteration as the Shinwok Residential School. Um, and this is a, an image circa 1934. And you'll see what it looks like today. So Shimok is actually part of Algoma University. So it's interesting to consider what it means to have students going to school in a former residential school. And here you'll see the cairn. And there's a counter monument to this that you can see in the photo to uh, the, the initial uh, principal of the school and one of its founders, the Reverend E.F. E. Wilson. Now, I don't want to get into a long background about that school or about residential schools in general, but I do want to talk about Chief Xing Wok, um, for whom the school is named. Um, he was chief of the Garden River Ojibwe. He, he was involved in the War of 1812. Um, he was uh, very proactive in trying to bring education to um, his people. And he had uh, conceived um, hybrid system where traditional Anishinaabe teaching would be merged with Eurocentric teaching. And he uh, called this a teaching wigwam, and his sons uh, were the ones who really raised uh, the principal funds to move forward. Now, his sons met E.F. Wilson, and together they traveled, they fundraised, and they campaigned, and that's where the funding uh, for uh, the schools um, came about. And and the Education Trust, um, which is now funding um, Shingwok School in its most recent incarnation. Now, I thought there would be some heritage conservation stream students here today. We have a few? Okay, <laughs> okay. Um, I have a very um, brief overview of, of the school. So the first school, um, was actually erected in Garden River, right in the community, which is um, certainly different from what we know of other residential schools, and it was before the residential school system uh, in 1873, but it burnt down. It was a structure made of wood. Uh, it burnt down six days after com com completion, but undaunted, um, they decided to build a second school, uh, Mason Reconstruction this time, but located it on the bank of St. Mary's River, close to Sault Ste. Marie. Um, and that operated uh, up until 1934. The building was deteriorating. Um, and the, the uh, third incarnation, which was the one that I showed you on the title screen, was built. Um, that school closed in 1970. And in 1971, Algoma University moved in. Um, survivor groups from Shingwok School met as early as 1981, one of the earliest gatherings of survivors. Um, and in uh, 2006, the Shingwok Education Trust um, uh, signed a covenant uh, with Algoma University to establish Shingwok Gamagi Gamay, an independent degree granting post-secondary institutions <coughs> offering an Anishinaabe education. And you can see here the second school. was demolished when the 1934 school was constructed. 
And that was an industrial school, and there's a bit of a difference between the industrial school model and the residential school model. It had a tailoring shop, uh, it had uh, a baker shop, it had um, a carpenter shop, and a print shop. And these are the elevations for uh, the Xinhua Residential School, the 1934 building that you saw. And so this is really the structure that we're dealing with. <laughs> I always find <clears throat> that it's difficult to begin talking about this type of work because I've been doing it for such a long period of time now. And I've been pulled and pushed in different ways in terms of figuring out ways to negotiate these spaces, whether it's a museum, an art gallery, whether it's a photograph or an archive. What I found that was interesting about this project was looking at its relationship to the work that I've been doing on residential schools since 2001, when I was first approached by the Aboriginal Healing Foundation to curate an exhibition on residential schools. I didn't have very much time to do it, but it began with the simple request that they were responding to the intergenerational community that was asking questions about residential schools. And there wasn't anything available to them. They had to contend with the fact that this was a part of history that Canada didn't want to teach. And it was also problematic in terms of their community and people that were affected by residential schools and didn't want to talk about it. It fell in line with my work in terms of looking at how do we make the invisible visible. It very simply began with my experience of growing up in the city of questioning my teachers and asking why we didn't learn about indigenous history. And facing that invisible wall, what is it? What is it that we face? How do we deal with it? How do we begin to move out of this place that we've been pushed into, this unnatural space that we've been pushed into? So these questions began festering in my mind from a time I was a young boy. When I began working on the Where Are the Children exhibition, I had no idea about the photographic history of residential schools, but the Aboriginal Healing Foundation wanted a photographic exhibition of residential schools. I was invited to take part in this project because of my familiarity with Library and Archives Canada's collection. It began in 1996 when I was invited to co-curate an exhibition on the collection of photographs related to Indigenous people. It opened in 1996 at Library and Archives it was called Aboriginal Portraits from the National Archives of Canada. And right from the beginning, 
I was dealing with the subtleties of looking at history and looking at audience and how do you engage people? And how do you get them or encourage them or create a conversation or a platform so that people begin looking beyond stereotypes? Whether it's what they see in everyday life or whether it's what they've learned from TV or what they haven't learned in the classroom. When I began looking through the archives collection, I hadn't really looked at photographs of residential schools. So this was new to me. It was only new in the sense that I didn't have any relatives that had gone to residential school. But I certainly was a person that grew up in a society dealing with systemic racism and dealing with stereotypes and thinking that there had to be something better than this. So as I started my research, I began finding photographs, putting them together, and they were really not anything that was hard hitting. They were typical photographs of kids in classrooms, of kids posed in front of uh, school buildings. And the question was put to me when I, we had a review of the material that I had accumulated was that people were disappointed because they thought there had to be more than this, but there wasn't. If there were photographs that showed the types of abuses that had been set by survivors of residential schools, they didn't exist, at least not in public archives. So once again, it was a question of invisibility. And what I began to realize is that survivors and the people that were looking at the images that I've laid out for, for review were looking to make that experience visible. That survivors wanted something that they could hold out there and they could say, this is what happened to me. Well, they didn't exist. So once again, the question was, is how do we take photographs that we have in the collection and begin putting them into context for people to be able to relate to those experiences? What I was looking at as well was how do I layer history onto that? Because what I began to realize is that history was the most important element of this experience, of looking at where it came from, how long it has been in existence, and also looking at residential schools, not just as kind of an isolated part of history, but as part of colonialism. And then when we begin looking at the social issues that we're dealing with today, whether it's on reserve or in cities, we have to look at residential schools and we have to look at colonialism. Because Indians were made to feel inferior right from the beginning. And it didn't stop when we went into residential schools. And it just became another arm of that type of, what are we going to do with the Indians? So I started looking for evidence that I could layer the photographs with in terms of text. What do the people in those schools think about, or the administrators think about, or the government officials think about when they're putting children into these situations? So I started looking for photographs of people that were in positions of power, and this is the first one that I found. This is Hayter Reed, who was the Deputy Superintendent of Indian Affairs in the 1890s. He had also been an Indian agent out west. He was a part of the suppression movement of the Cree people who took part in the so-called uh, Riel Rebellion in 1885. He had a hand in what was going on in the west, and then it came to a higher level in terms of working in the federal government as well. I pulled this photograph because I was interested in looking and questioning my audience in terms of what kind of Indian do you think this man is? And what I wanted to also convey was the sense of the layering in terms of the complexity of that history. Why was this man, Hayter Reed, who from what he had written hated Indians, why was it all of a sudden he was wearing an outfit like this? In 1896, there was a costume ball on Parliament Hill. And the theme of the ball was to promote Canadian history. They felt that Canadians weren't well-versed enough and appreciated their history. So he assumed the character of Donnacona, who met Cartier when he first came to Canada or to Turtle Island. And that's his stepson, Jack Lowry. Hayter Reed probably accumulated this, this outfit when he was out west as an Indian agent. When I was reading through the material, a lot of the early politicians and school superintendents and teachers were talking about the issues that 
of the way that they were putting Indians into context, that the troubles that they were having educating young people was the parents themselves, that they weren't willing to give up the old ways, the traditional ways that they had used for thousands of years. And so I wanted to show this photograph because it was really kind of illustrative. If they were going to put up a photograph of what they were battling against, this is the type of person that they were. And this was seen as bad. It was seen as negative. But here was a man and people from that generation who were trying to hang on to their culture. They didn't want to give it up, and they couldn't understand why they had to give it up. They had negotiated relationships with the, with the Canadian people in terms of accommodation, and a partnership, but that soon dissipated. I was also looking uh, through the government session reports, and for the year 1896, I was really surprised because I opened up the volume, and the first thing I saw was this photograph of Thomas More. He was the poster boy for residential schools or for the industrial schools in the 1890s. The idea was was to show the good work that the residential schools were carrying out during that period of time. And so there was kind of this before and after photograph of Thomas More. This is typical of the type of photographs that I was finding during that period of time. And how do you put this photograph into context? You begin looking at, first of all, the number of children that were at residential schools, how young they were, and also the fact that you don't see any parents or any adult indigenous people within that crowd. This is a photograph from the 1960s in central Manitoba, the Puckadawagan Reserve. This was a series of photographs that came into the archives while I was working there. And it was actually uh, photographs that were taken by one of the sisters, Sister Lillian. And she documented the activities that were taking place at the residential schools, at that particular residential school. And these photographs really, what I found, put into context that issue of the transference of power, of how you see the parents in the background, how you see the sisters holding the triplets. And it was just simply being able to look at that photograph, read it, and see the relationships that were going on there. One of the uh, points of the exhibition, the second part of the title was Healing the Legacy of Residential Schools. And the question was, is how do we go about doing that? And one of the things that I wanted to do was to talk to uh, survivors and to also look at family photo albums as a counterpoint to the institutional archive as well. And so I was going out to Saskatoon to give a talk and I asked a friend of mine, Lori Blundo, if she knew anybody who would speak to me who had gone to residential schools. And she said, well, my grandmother went uh, but she doesn't talk about those experiences. But by the time I got out to Saskatoon, she, Lori came up and she says, well, my grandmother will be willing to speak to you. So we went out to the Gordons Reserve, sat at her table, and one of the first things I asked her was, do you have any photographs of residential school? She went to residential school right out in the reserve, at, on the Gordons Reserve. And so she started going through her photo album. And there's my friend Lori and Lori's mother sitting across from her. And she had four photo albums, and we went through them and paged through them during the afternoon. And finally, at the end, she found some photographs of herself and her brothers and sisters at residential school. And the only thing that she really said about her experiences there, and I didn't push her to ask about, were you physically, sexually, or mentally abused? But what was it like for you to be at that residential school? I didn't even have to ask her that. And she started talking about, while she was looking at the photograph, about how lonely they were, that they could see family, they could see relatives going by the school every day, but they couldn't talk to them. And they couldn't, she couldn't talk to her brothers because they were segregated in the school. But the idea was, was how do we begin generating a conversation on residential schools? How do we take these photographs, put them into a public domain, into a gallery space, into um, a resource center, into um, any kind of place on, in a community that would be able to set up these photographs and encourage people to start sharing the stories that they told when they were at residential school. This is an example of, of the exhibition itself. In terms of the information that we provide, it begins with a map. And the map has on it um, a relationship to a, a directory with it that outlines all of the residential schools across Canada. So the idea is, is that when people come in, is that they can actually find the school that they had attended. And that's where that journey begins. So in terms of making the invisible vis visible, this is where it starts, about looking at these maps and then finding the journey, and beginning the journey with that map, 
and also taking into consideration that it's continuing. This is a very brief overview of where the children, and I'm not here to speak specifically about this, but what I'm finding now, and Trina and I have worked together for a number of years, where the children has continued to travel across Canada since that time, since 2002 when it officially opened, and it's continued to travel. And the last one was at the Glenbow Museum uh, in November of uh, last year. But the thing is, is that um, we've continued to refine the exhibition, add new layers to it, and now working with the Shingwa project is a really interesting experience for me because now what we're doing is we're isolating, we're coming into one community and talking about how do we reconfigure this space, how do we take a residential school, how do we take the memory of that place and create a space where the people are asking for something, where they can gather, where they can talk, and where they can heal from, and that's our job. So how do we go into that space and make that happen? So you'll hear the outline of how we're looking at the space as well, but the idea is, is that the community is asking for Rather than tearing down the school or burning the school, they're looking at it as a revitalization of their culture. So how do we not avoid that history, but how do we take what it represents and make it into something useful for us? And we come back to the idea of education. That education was made into a word where people feared hearing that. Where they feared about what happened to their children when they were being taken away. They feared the fact that their children may never return home again. How do we convey that to the audience? How do we get people of non-Indigenous and Indigenous to begin talking about the experience and relate to it in a way that you could imagine your own children being taken away from you when they're maybe six or seven years old and not seeing them and not having the right or the ability to go to that school and to check up on them. How does that make you feel? How did that make you feel? How did it make those people feel at that time? especially when we talk about language barriers, the cultural barriers that were existing at that period of time as well. So here's an example of, of where the children, and looking at the space, and thinking about what do they want here? What are we gonna provide for them? How are we gonna create a safe space so that these things can begin to change? And I think I'll end there now, because I don't wanna take too much of the space because I'm sharing the panel here, so I'll end there for now. So, I'm David Lemelick, and uh, just to give you a little background on who I am, what I do, what my, game, my role is in this, this project, I'm the exhibit designer. Um, I typically take blank spaces and I furnish them to tell stories. Uh, in the case of Shinwa Hall, we're dealing with a very, I'll show you the first picture, we're dealing with a very degraded space. We're dealing with a space that's had a lot of interventions over the last uh, few decades. The sound booth you see up top is the actual auditorium space. The sound booth you see up, up top in that lovely knotty knot of pine, that's all recent additions and there's a, there's a mess of electro, electric, uh, electrical that's probably not up to code up in that ceiling. It's actually a very beautiful space. Uh, this has been really manhandled over the last few decades. Uh, I guess university budgets being what they are, they, they did what they could through the centimeters. Um, but obviously, this is, another, uh, this is the transversal hall. Oh, sorry, so this is the hall leading from the uh, front entrance of the school uh, building, looking down towards uh, the auditorium itself. But as you can tell, it's a very narrow space, lovely drop ceiling, uh, an awful lot of signage that's been thrown in. And, I don't know. There we go. <laughs> and this is from the opposite direction, looking from the auditorium towards the front hall, which looks out onto the uh, the, the main space, uh, the main entrance of the, of the building. So, obviously we're dealing with a space that's been very uh, uh, damaged over the, over the years. And we're also dealing with a space that's got uh, multiple uses. We've got a university intersecting with a, uh, an interpretive center who's trying to remember, who's trying to commemorate uh, the lives of these, uh, of these students. So we have to sort of juggle both, uh, both needs at the same time. So, storytelling, when we get to something like this, we're looking to create um, a story through the finishes, through the colors, through the textures, the shapes that is going to bring us back in time, and recreate a space that's more uh, natural, um, so that the space can actually become supporting of the narrative. We really tell a story in a in a subtle uh, in a subtle sense. 
the hall also needs to be used for meetings, a gallery space, and performances. So we're dealing with a multi-purpose space, a space that needs to be transformed easily, the minimum of uh, skilled labor. So in drawing inspiration, drawing inspiration for the, uh, for the, uh, the finishes and the shapes, we're trying to find uh, modern shapes that evoke natural, uh, natural finishes, natural uh, textures. We're trying to find uh, shapes which allow us to uh, evoke nature without naturalizing space. So we're looking at uh, materials that have been man-made, but have been given shapes and textures that evoke natural sense, the natural uh, reality. Um, at the same time, the transformation of these materials evoke the resilience of the students who have been taken from their natural environment and dragged through a, a colonial, colonialization uh, process through the schools and yet still emerge uh, resilient and, and uh, successful throughout. The, uh, the story is basically laid out in a series of, uh, of steps. Um, the beginning of the story, we're going to tackle on the outside and deal with the, the background story of uh, the Anishinaabe before uh, the arrival of European uh, influence. And uh, using a series of, uh, of columns, steel columns with a laser etching of the natural um, foliage patterns, lit from within with colored lanterns, colored lights, to create a, uh, a symbolic procession of children leading, leading from the exterior and heading towards the, uh, the school itself. Uh, the columns column would be visible at night, uh, providing with a, uh, a memorial that's viewable from the street level from the, uh, for the university. That active panels would include, would be incorporated in these panels, in these lanterns, sorry, uh, to uh, explain context for the uh, pre-colonial culture of the Anishinaabe in the, uh, in the region. Uh, upon entering the building, as we saw, the exterior of the building is very, it's very grandiose, very massive uh, building, typical of uh, institutional buildings at that time. But the interior is very modest, it's actually quite impressive. Um, so what we're looking to do is to leverage that, that contrast of, of, uh, of spaces to communicate the, uh, the, the trauma the children face when they're leaving their natural, uh, habitual environment and entering this, this formal, um, uh, unusual space for them. So as we're peeling back the layers of, uh, of the 1970s um, wood, we're also going to raise the ceiling and create a progression of spaces where you enter to the main vestibule, which will be quite tall, at about uh, 18 feet, and progressively draw you down to narrow and narrow hallways and that ultimately uh, uh, culminates in the, uh, in the auditorium itself, which is very uh, tall vaulted space <coughs> with a, a uh, beautiful wood ceiling. Uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be re 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 bringing the auditorium back to the 19, late 1950s uh, uh, look and feel and recreating the presenium arch, which was removed. I'm sorry, I'm going to back to the <coughs> So that we can recreate the space that the kids uh, felt good in when they walked in. The idea being that as we have survivors enter and, and visit the space, we want to recreate as much of a positive impression as we can. We're going to take away as much of the 70s as we can. We're going to disguise the, uh, the speakers, the lighting behind the existing uh, wood structures to <coughs> really bring the, uh, bring the visitor back to the original period of the, uh, of the building. In the center, uh, because interactivity is is key to making to communicating the story. If we have just didactic panels, people don't read. Uh, a lot of people don't read, and a lot of people who do read don't necessarily capture information uh, effectively that way. So we want to bring in as much interactivity as possible. Uh, one of the uh, possibilities we're looking at is the idea of using children's desks and mounting interactive screens inside them, so that people can actually query information. We can go back. And uh, look at pictures of children. The actual content hasn't been derived yet, but that would be uh, at once uh, symbolic of the, of the classroom, but also interactive, where people can 
approach and hand, hands on uh, and, and hands on relationship with the information. The uh, movable, uh, the movable uh, chalkboard at the front would also be a didactic panel again uh, to create that, that sense of uh, the schoolroom. Uh, around this, uh, this this montage would be a series of towers uh, which will contain uh, some interactive panels as well as some uh, motion sensitive uh, motion triggered uh, graphics so we're talking about lenticular graphics we're talking about things that as you approach will move will trigger so that we catch people off guard and manage to communicate information without people having to actually uh, look for it themselves or read themselves um, these, the reason for these towers is that because the space has to be multi-purpose those towers have to be able to fold in on themselves to create a display service on the outside could be reused for uh, for um, uh, for gallery space and also removable for when we have uh, performances in the, in the space itself. The rear wall, oh, which you won't see, the rear wall of the auditorium will actually be a uh, retrospective of the building itself, its, its history, and also the process of, uh, of uh, restoring it and doing the uh, of space uh, for the uh, for the children that she uh, A transversal hall, uh, because again, you leave the university with an, an interpretive center in it. There's a transversal hall that bisects the uh, the, uh, the entrance. That actual hall connects to the university, and we'll be using that to showcase the children of Shinwa and the larger context of the children of Shinwa being. The uh, graduates also from the university, so we'll have a multiple layered treatment where we'll be dealing with the, the children as a background image, and then graduates from the school and graduates from the university all intermingled so that we have a constant narrative from the, the original uh, residential school children through to the present day with the university and celebrating their, uh, all of their successes. And Trina, can I pass that on to you? Sure.
school itself is not a designated heritage site. Um, that's not to say that we won't be looking at uh, standards and guidelines for heritage conservation when we look at the restoration re and rehabilitative part of the project. Um, but it's interesting to note that that residential school is not a designated heritage site. And that's a, a problem with heritage, which is the focus of a completely different discussion. But what we're left with is not just a school, but the grounds of a school. And there are parts in the grounds that are also storage spaces where important things happen. Um, I showed you the sort of riverscape earlier, um, and it showed the original building. So the 1934 building, one that has been subsumed by Algoma University, um, is not on the same footing. So that the, the spectral presence of that original school exists. The cemetery is closely located to, to, to the school. Shingwa Kumaki can make is also within the compound. So there are storied spaces uh, within the, uh, the overall site, a landscape. Um, and one of, I guess, my roles on, on this job, um, a couple of them, one was to visit the site, and I've done this a number of times, I've spent some time there, talked to a number of people there, um, done some consultations, um, and really tried to get a feel for the space um, and the opportunities and limitations of those spaces. One of the main limitations is we're dealing with the university, there are students going through, the building is old, viewing distances are extremely short, okay? So in some of the spaces uh, where we're expected to put exhibitions, you have to look at them from a distance like this, which is quite problematic. And so the way that things are designed is that uh, half of the time, only half of the exhibition is, is, is on display. And the reason why is that the auditorium space where most of the exhibitions are going to be housed is a multi-purpose space. They want to be able to bring in uh, art exhibitions, they want to be able to use it as a theater. So that means that all of our exhibitions in that space have to be mobile, okay? So then, considering this limitation, how do we expand into a larger footprint? So we look at the grounds. Um, and we have to look at, well, what parts of the story are told on the grounds? And it brings to the question of, what exactly are we representing? What are we looking at here as history? What is representation we're creating? Is it a representation around the residential school? Is it the residential school within a larger context of, of, of assimilation? Does it have to do more with the Ojibwe of Garden River and the other communities? Um, and what we found in the consultations is that we have stakeholders with obviously conflicting ideas about how the space should be used. And so we're trying to accommodate a number of ideas within a broader narrative arc, which isn't entirely residential Put up this picture representing a difficult and contested history. Um, Shingon School is, is different in a number of respects from other residential schools. It's a much older school. It's a school that was originally based on uh, a vision of the teaching wigwam, which was a hybrid space, which was um, a space championed by uh, Chief Shingwa, um, a place to combine traditional uh, Anishinaabe education with uh, Eurocentric education. Um, the first schools were at his behest, and those were the fundraisers, principal fundraisers, as I mentioned. And so, really, um, Shingwa is a visionary, and he's regarded in the community as a visionary. Um, and this person, this is one of his sons, and then this is Siakota, and I find this photograph so fascinating, and I wish somebody would unpack this, because I find it neat, but it, it talks about some of those tensions. Um, and it's interesting to note that Shinwa uh, was converted to Christianity, and he, he had been a member of the Medellin Lodge, and as such, would have been schooled in Medellin's teachings, and among them, the Seven Sacred Spires Prophecy, uh, which prophesied the coming of Europeans. Um, he was also uh, a devout Christian, as were his sons. This person, the Reverend Ian Wilson, became a completely disillusioned Christian. self-determination for indigenous peoples. And there's a really interesting role reversal in a sense that's going on here. There's a lot of complexity to this story, but also there's some issues with how um, the people of the community and the various stakeholders want to remember the past. John Uri tells us in, in 
how societies remember the past, the past is viewed as real. The past and future are, are ideational, or what we would now say representational. The past is entirely constructed in and through the present. Well, what a burden to place on people who are curating and designing exhibitions in terms of historical representation. And so it's our job to try to navigate um, and, and I suppose mediate all of the um, directives that were given by the various stakeholders and try to put something out for them to consider. And one of the ways that we do that is visually. So I talked about how we're contextualizing residential schools. Well, one of the ways is not to look at residential schools beyond that at all, but to look at Turtle Island and to look at creation stories, to do something that is reaffirming. And um, we also are looking at where to map content. And so part of this story um, is mapped on the grounds of the school. I hate reading from papers, but I'm going to read from my paper for a little bit. The narrative arc of the exhibition contextualizes Shingwa Hall past and present within a larger narrative of contact, change, loss, and reclamation. Its spaces encompass the front grounds leading up to the building's grand entrance, the corridor and transversal hallway, the vestibule to the auditorium, a really quirky space, and the auditorium itself. Uh, design elements from the exhibition will be integrated into the east wing of the addition at ground level through to the Shingwak Indian Residential School Center, which is located nowhere near the auditorium, creating another issue. The narrative arc still in development was formed by discussion and interviews with representatives of the Shingwak Indian Residential School Center, Shingwak Inamaki Gimik, Algoma University, and the Children of Shingwak Alumni Association. <coughs> um, this design strategy doesn't create a linear narrative, although the zones and the presenter in sequence, rather it examines stories at crossroad points of convergence through layer making and juxtaposition. So this is a graphic that was generated for an idea for zone one. Location, the front grounds, at the, at the front of the main Algoma building, former Shingwa Indian Residential School, and it's the history of Turtle Island and the, and the Anishinaabe, traditional ways of life in all its diversity, contact with European settlers and religion, through to arrival of children from different First Nations to the grounds of the first Shingwa schools. And the emphasis here is on the children coming to the schools and, and communicating the fact that they can come uneducated. They were educated in their own traditions. Um, and also, it creates of the grand entry of the school this threshold from one environment to another. These are some of the uh, children, uh, some of the first generation who went to the school. Another thing that sort of sets the Shingon School apart is that we actually have this evidence of some of the children who went to the school. And you can see that they're, they're differing, that's not a different name, sorry, their different names are still um, uh, there being recorded. Um, although you'll also number, you know, it's not here, they were also assigned numbers, but we really wanted to also very prominently feature the children, and we have all this evidence of children who went there. So this is another kind of storyboard of ways that, that this information can, can come across. One of the sections uh, that leads into the auditorium is about Chief Shingwak and his vision, and you'll see a picture of uh, Chief Augustine Shingwak, one of his sons, and his wife. And Chief Augustine Shingwak actually uh, wrote a journal, and it's quite an extensive journal, about um, the collective efforts of the Shingwak chiefs and sons to, to raise money for, for the school. Now, at one point, the school went from an industrial school, and that's really with the demolition of the one building in 1934, and was taken over. Um, by a residential school. And that was a real transition in the policy as well. Um, the, by that point, the early industrial school model was being phased out and the residential school model was being phased in. There were both residential schools in the sense that children went there, but what happened is the trades uh, training and all the funding for the trades training uh, faded away as um, formal education and really a very basic level of education um, and religious education became increasingly so 
When I had said that we can only show half, half, half the exhibition is shown half of the time, we thought about, well, what is essential to show? And overwhelmingly, um, um, it became clear that Chi Xinhua and, and the story of the Chi Wigwam, of that concept, of that vision, was essential to show. We move into the dark years, and so, Here we show how the Shinhawk School was assimilated into a larger residential school system and went into a period of uh, decline over that time. E.F. Wilson by that time had become totally disillusioned. Um, he had tried uh, really um, without success through a society called the Canadian Indian Research and Aid Society, which is the Indian Conference, to advocate for, for uh, self-determination and rights. Um, he fought against um, severalty, um, uh, which is the allotment of uh, private lands in a, in a fee simple format. He uh, eventually uh, spoke out against residential schools and he resigned from his position. Um, and the school went into decline uh, during that period. The government assumed uh, um, full administrative authority for the school and the Anglican Church continued to run the school. So again, this isn't what is going to be in the, ex the exhibition. This is uh, a, um, it's like a mood board. Um, it's a visual storyboard to look at how that story might be told. And um, this is uh, the hallway uh, that David had alluded to. So this is how some of those uh, storyboards can actually be applied. So David has done uh, a 3D model based on um, parts of the school um, I've done uh, 2D graphics, which David has then applied. So we actually get to see how this works. So I had said, you know, is it a museum? Is it a memorial? Well, this wall serves a couple of functions. Um, it juxtaposes the three types of images that David mentioned. So we have the images of the children who originally went to the school. We have images of survivors. And the survivors, so the children of Shingwak alumni Association, wanted their wall of fame. They wanted their stories, their contemporary stories, to honor that. And so they're part of that um, triptych juxtaposition. And here you'll see um, selfies of students at Algoma University. And the idea behind this wall is we're all children of Shamewalk. So in a sense, it's a memorial wall uh, to children who passed through um, Shamewalk Walk Halls. But at the same time, it looks to the future and it looks to the current generation of students who are realizing Shamewalk's bit why I'm saying realizing Shingwak's vision is because both Algoma University and Shingwak Kitamaki Kame um, feel that they have actually established a teaching wigwam. Uh, Shingwak Kitamaki Kame being an Anishinaabe college, fully accredited college. And here we'll see gathering. So the types of photographs that Jeff was talking about before, the kinds of things that are more typically found in archives, juxtaposed with the 1991 gathering where they decided that they wanted to found Shingwak Gumaki Gimik. And here's another view. And I feel kind of bad because I'm really showing off uh, uh, the very talented David's work here. But this is the entry point. If you come from outside, you remember the grand, the grand entry to the building? That collegiate Gothic style? This is the entryway here. And then, of course, we have to have wayfinding. And then this is the corridor leading down into the auditorium. And you'll see here images of um, wood. So that structure, and this is just a, uh, a graphic, is meant to evoke uh, a traditional teaching lodge. And so we wanted to bring some of the architectural elements associated with uh, traditional uh, uh, teaching into the actual um, residential school space. And one of the visual metaphors that we wanted to show was this change that happened and, and the loss that came with that change. And so what will happen in the space is that that, that architecture of um, the teaching lodge will be brought into the space and it will eventually degrade and give way. And you'll be faced with the facade at the threshold to the auditorium, which is in that collegiate garden. another view. And I think that's the last image. Yeah, here's another view. Um, and then one of the things we also wanted to incorporate, um, and David was talking 
the grass, was some sort of um, strategy to have the movement in the space, um, either through uh, lenticular graphics was one of the ideas, cinema grass was another idea. Um, and I recently learned about an exhibition that I never had the opportunity to see, but which I had, uh, which was at the uh, Jewish Museum in Vienna, um, in a class where Lisa Greenberg, who's with us, presented. She talked about holograms as a way of um, creating uh, images where the visitor has to move around. And we had wanted to find some kind of visual metaphor that was going to explain cultural loss and reformation. And Jeff and I, in discussions about this, Jeff had talked about um, powwows and about dancing. Um, and we had wanted to look at putting together some kind of video that showed, um, I think it was men's traditional and women's jingle dress dancing, um, and then show, show over a period of time the dancers forgetting their dance, um, and perhaps being students in a school, and perhaps there would be a, a girl who would be playing hopscotch reenacting the steps of the dance and not knowing that that's what she's doing. And eventually, for cultural reclamation, revitalization, the relearning of the dances. So we wanted to have this thread of this traditional cultural expression lost and regained. And one of the ways to do that, I was hoping, like the holograms, would be, could be through lenticular graphics, cinema graphs, and those sorts of things. Because what happens with those kind of technologies is to make them work the visitor has to move. The visitor has to move to do to do the dance, and that implicates them in healing and revitalization. And I'm going to end there because I think I'm really over time. So that's about it. I hope uh, we gave you an idea of what we're doing. This is very much an exhibition in development, and our next stage is to take our storyboards and our ideas uh, back to the community to to see. So that's where we're at in the process. Thank you. We have about 10-15 minutes for questions. So who would like to ask a question? Are you using sound at all in your installation? Oh my god, oral histories. We completely forgot to talk about that. <laughs> but absolutely. And um, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Sorry. How are we going to use oral history? Yeah. Um, well, the lanterns that David talked about, those um, those structures that are going to be on the exterior that unfortunately we don't have visuals for, are going to be on a motion sensor. And when a visitor comes close to them, they'll hear a story. So probably uh, the survivor story um, about experiences. But, but different different uh, stories as well. That's one of the areas in which the, um, the uh, Children of Shingwak Alumni Association, the Survivor Association, can really actively participate. And part of this project that's already happened has been um, to take portraits and to do interviews with some of those survivors. Um, so that's definitely part of the mix. And thank you so much, Sophie, for asking, because I can't believe we didn't talk about that. Uh, and also like that, sound, sound is a bit of, a, of an issue because of the multi-purpose uh, use of this, this space, because there's so many university students walking through this, it's, it's an active space. Uh, there's a lot of sound bleep bleep is a problem, so we have to really contain the sound, and we have to do sound in a way that is either very, very discreet, or that's on demand, or that's motion triggered. So those are all things where the sound comes into play with things that are touch sensitive where you can actually trigger a sound or where I can contain the sound uh, to, uh, to a headset or to a, a very localized speaker. So sound can be tricky in, in, a, in a space like this where you're dealing with not just a, an audience but also just passers-by. I will take the opportunity to ask Jeff a question. Jeff, to what extent do you see this more educational work as a continuity between your photographic work or an educational like, exhibition framework. Did you see it as part of the thing, the same thing, or is it? Yeah, it is. Um, uh, I found that early in my career that there was an overlap in terms of looking, um, of making photographs and also working with historical photographs as well. 
and I'm self-taught, and also I was invited to take part as, as curator as well. So it kind of, I wasn't trained, but I had a sense of space and how to use it, and it worked. So there has been, for me it's hard, I can't tell the difference anymore between what I do as a photographer and what I do as a curator. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to all have, have blended into, um, into one thing. And did the experience of, of working at that stratification your relationship to dark technology in some ways? I think it gave it more of a framework in terms of the issues that needed to be addressed and how to go about doing that. And I think when you look at library and archives, in, in the 90s, you would go in and you'd use an index card catalog to go through it. And I remember that there were there were four drawers that were dedicated to indigenous people amongst six rows of file cabinet cards. And I started looking through the rest of the file cabinet cards looking for representation of indigenous people outside of those four. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find any. So I began thinking, so this was the, the idea of, well, how do we integrate those file cards into mainstream index cards in that, in that system. So really that was the fundamental way of, of looking at the archive and uh, looking at this work as well. So it wasn't, you couldn't just do it photographically, mm -hmm. but you had to begin thinking about how do you use what's there and move it out. Um, two questions. Um, so you strategies for the grounds is to try to recreate what was using augmented reality and those types of technologies. Um, and, you know, for our own site visit, and we've done two of them, we've never been uh, invited into the chapel. Uh, the chapel has always been kind of off limits. So that makes it a very problematic space. I, I, all, I, I, I also find it very problematic that, that both the chapel and the cemetery are designated, um, municipally designated heritage sites, mm -hmm. um, and part, in part because of their association with the school, which itself is not designated. And I find that very, very strange. Um, so it's certainly part of the plan um, to have some kind of interpretation, um, but, but I don't know where that's going to lead us. And I don't know if those doors will open for us. Um, it really remains to be seen. I'm hoping that um, our plan wows them and everything opens up, but we don't know. We don't even know how they're going to react, how all the stakeholders are going to react to what we've done. But certainly, um, you know, we've begun a process um, that, that, incidentally, this phase one process terminates with design but not implementation. So this is going to be part of a multi-phase and I certainly do hope 
how this child was integrated. Great. Um, and this is the second part of the question. And Peter, you've got to help me out here. Lisa Prosper. Um, yes. That's the name I've been thinking of. So Lisa Prosper um, uh, has published uh, about cultural landscapes and acts of remembering. And, and, and so I find that there's, uh, I'd be curious to hear what her, her take on uh, this cultural landscape interpretation will be because she, she indicated that class and interpretive panels are for people who are unfamiliar with the history of the place. Um, so, but the people who experience it firsthand, of course, they know it's history, they don't need signage to tell them about it. Um, so, I, I suppose these, you know, the point of this exhibition is it, it's not for the survivors from that school. It is, it is, it is, and they're driving it. Uh, I know what you're saying, and I'm familiar with Lisa Prosper's work. work. How does that work? Yeah. We're here at their behalf, we're doing this at their behalf. So, uh, it was a, it was a combination of survivors and some people at Algoma University, mostly Don Jackson, who started the Shingwa project, which is a massive um, and sort of long-term archiving project, collecting and archiving project, with a mandate to share, heal, and learn. So the survivors in that area are intensely focused on collecting and documenting, and they're now in a stage where they want to exhibit. And and. You know, in that regard, it actually bears more resemblance to a community museum than any of the other kind of constructs. Um, people are really interested in establishing some form around what they know. So it's sort of the opposite of what we're hearing from, 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 Lisa, from Lisa Prosper about what's appropriate in an Indigenous context with respect to, to commemoration. But I can also tell you, um, I'm coming at this from having um, studied um, uh, all of the commemorations funded under the um, Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement that were community-led. So the settlement agreement set up $20 million um, for commemoration, and that was accessed by Indigenous communities, mostly First Nation communities. Um, and overwhelmingly, they produced material. They produced monuments, but that was a rated thing, so we can put that aside. But they also produced um, other materials, books, exhibitions, uh, artworks. So much of the commemoration was documentary in character. So, you know, I think that that the survivors really do want to, to, to express, to share and to express um, those experiences. And, and I think that, that they want to impart them to younger generations. At least that's been my experience. Children of Shingwak Alumni Association, which is the survivor group, and then 
Geek and Meg, which is the Anishinaabe College. So those are really the stakeholders. Out of those, we have a client because we have a contract, and our client is actually Algoma University and um, the Shingwa Project. The people who control the Shingwa Project are the children of Shingwa um, Alumni Association with some representation from the university. So out of those four, those are the two that we're really focused on the most. Um, the people whose vision has diverged the most from what the other groups want to do are actually Shingwa Kanabaki Gume, the Anishinaabe College. So for example, one of the um, areas is that they are very interested in having a, um, a larger story told about what has been called, and we really don't like this term, it's very problematic, but the forever history, and they really want to frame that within the day when teaching. And that becomes problematic because um, it doesn't represent everybody, it doesn't represent all of the stakeholders. It's a particular uh, cultural um, tradition that, that is just not inclusive uh, in a way that some of the other stakeholders think that that the exhibition should be. So that's one of the one of the conflicts, right? The way we look at this and the way that we try to navigate those is obviously we try to please everyone. First and foremost, we try to please the survivors, and we're trying to honor the survivors, and we're trying to do that in a way that that is workable with the university. And one of the things that I think might make this a little bit easier for us is that in on this site, I don't think that the survivors are interested in seeing the auditorium be a place where we show, where we represent trauma in a very visual or or difficult way. They really want to focus on things like revitalization and healing. Um, and so, you know, if that weren't the case, then I bet you we'd have difficulty with the university. So we're trying to kind of mediate all of those things, and I find that my own experience and, and my colleagues probably have different experiences, but my own my own experience is is, is visual storyboarding. Um, you know, you what everyone says, you know they're not quite reconcilable, but for some reason visuals can really help to get people to, 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 to achieve common ground, and, and that's been a successful strategy. That being said, some of these things are irreconcilable, and then if that's the case, one of the ways to, to kind of deal with that is to actually uh, pursue complexity in the narrative itself. Did I answer your question? Oh. One more one more. Um, well, I have two questions. Uh, one of them is about change, and I'm curious whether you thought about it or whether there's a possibility to design change into the exhibition, just because it seems to me that at a time when narratives are forming, they're going to change, and that's the that's that's one aspect of the change question. The other aspect of the change question is whether actually survivors or other stakeholders would be able to change the exhibition itself on an ongoing basis. Um, so that's those are two things. And then the second question, which is partially related to change, is that is there a point at which the, and I think this image really speaks to this, at, at which the exhibition and the branding of the university get mixed up in a slightly unhealthy um, and so when that happens, that comes back to the question of change, because maybe this is the constellation within which you have to work right now, and maybe that is going to change. Um, yeah, that, okay. <laughs> it's funny what you're saying about the, the branding and this kind of, um, I'll just respond to that first. I, it's a really, it's, I'm so glad that you made that observation. For everybody here because, yeah, it's uncomfortable. It's difficult to bring the Algoma wayfinding into um, the exhibition. Um, it's funny because what we did was we make the Algoma branding conform to what we wanted to do instead of vice versa. So we'll see how that goes. Um, we do want to build in change uh, to the exhibition. One of the really exciting things about the rehabilitation of the 
auditorium is that it's going to be a really usable um, community space for um, not only art exhibitions and theatrical productions, but also all sorts of workshops. Um, for example, Christy Belcourt had uh, a community exhibition walking with her sisters uh, in this auditorium before the rehabilitation. And people in the Shingwat community really wanted to <coughs> contribute um, to that exhibition, but they didn't want to create vamps representing women. Moccasin vamps, they wanted to, to create moccasin vamps representing children. And they did that. And those remain with the um, university, and those will be brought into um, a larger kind of art plan that, that they're developing and that we'll be developing with them. So the idea is that that auditorium space will always be a productive space and that we, we're trying to find a way so that what is produced in those spaces can also uh, build on, enhance, but change the exhibition over time. So absolutely, um, we want to build change in. I don't think we're entirely sure how we're going to do that, um, but one thing we're going to do is study things like and, and I'm personally involved in, in, in this in my own PhD work, to study things like what's happening with walking or something and other exhibitions that are that are really, really successful at involving the public um, and being open to to whatever comes out of that process. I hope that answered your question. Yeah. Sort of? Sort of. I, I guess I'm curious about these walls, right? They're very flat and heavy. The walls are tricky because the first, it's, I wish I had the first iteration because we have the lens, the, the signage wasn't here. It, they were the lenticular graphics of the dance. So as you move past, the, the dancer would dance, as you dance, the dancer would dance. And that might be something that we, we revisit. The problem is this is the main entry to the university. And, um, and I think um, David showed you some of the photos Thank you all very much.